if you make a film set in a modern environment, we we go, oh yeah, 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 we 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 know about those. But if you show another period of history that that actually isn't so far removed and should be, I think in some respects it kind of highlights those things even more powerfully. Today's guests are director Philip Stevens and writer Laura Turner, who together have created historical thriller Lapwing. There's something about you, patients. He can't control you. Don't do anything silly, patients. Go! Back to your people! And it makes him sick. Drives him mad. Now, during the interview, there is a bit of lag in places thanks to the wonders of Zoom technology, but it shouldn't spoil your enjoyment. So, welcome uh, Phil and Laura uh, to Film Forum. Thank you so much for, for joining us. So, first of all, tell me about the film. Uh, I've seen the film and I, I really enjoyed it uh, and, and was really touched by it. Um, Thank you. But it's not necessarily a film that's completely aimed at someone like me. But, it, but I thought it was very. Uh, the themes involved were very, um, very universal in many ways. So tell me about the film. Sure. Yeah. Um, so Lapwing is a period drama set in 1555, and it's essentially a psychological thriller about a young woman called Patience, who has grown up as part of a small and very isolated community. Patience has a speech impediment um, and because of that she's essentially selectively mute. She is basically in a very toxic situation with her abusive brother-in-law David who is a man who seeks to control everyone around him and then into this kind of very isolated existence comes a family of Egyptian travellers who are seeking to escape the country because it was a time when um, the Egyptians Act had just been passed which was essentially the first anti-immigration legislation that was passed in this country but patients meets and falls falls in love or forms a very potent and important connection with the young Egyptian man and through this kind of journey of connection that she discovers with somebody else who understands what it's like to be an outsider and that really begins her journey of coming of age and of kind of self-realization that leads her to to start to want to stand up for herself, particularly to her brother-in-law, David. Phil, do you want to talk about what the themes are and uh, how you kind of looked at those when you were developing the script? Yeah, I mean, they're, you know, they're kind of wide ranging. Abuse and isolation and immigration and, um, and ignorance and um, patriarchy and all of the, you know, these things that we hear in, in, our, in our dialogue every day today. If you make a film set in a modern environment, we, we go, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we know about those. But if you show another period of history that, that actually isn't so far removed and should be, I think in some respects it kind of highlights those things even more powerfully. Part of what was attractive to me about the film was that it was just so relevant to our society today. And, and that being, you know, a shameful, um, a shameful thing to admit, you know, the fact that we've, we've moved so little in so many ways in the last 500 years. So it started off as a short film, I, I believe. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So how did you uh, go about developing it from a short into a feature? I mean, I suppose also the question is, why did you do that? This was, as originally as a short film, we had approached the BFI. We'd um, got very got to the last stages of um, what was once the iShorts program of, of from the BFI. And they were really enthusiastic about it and they really wanted to work with us, but they couldn't they basically just kept saying it's too ambitious you know we've never made a historical film um you know generally their eye shorts films were contemporary because contemporary is you know more manageable and affordable and they said we just don't see how you can do it on this budget it doesn't you know it doesn't make sense so we decided to make it into a feature film instead <laughs> which makes perfect sense it's far too ambitious let's make it bigger um which yeah which, which we did I think, you know, the kind of creative core, I suppose, of the story and the characters was absolutely there in the short film. You know, the short film was a very kind of intense examination of the moment at which a toxic situation kind of explodes very violently and dramatically. The, the next thing that we needed to do was really expand the world and kind of go, OK, well, this is the core of the 
emotional storyline and this kind of gives us our character framework for the protagonist's journey but what else is kind of going on in her world it became really important that we researched what else was going on in the country at that time that she might have interacted with one of the kind of key pieces of information that was you know of the time that we found out about was this Egyptians act that was passed in um, 1554 so by 1555 it was kind of in full in full um full reign really and um it basically said that anybody of Egyptian descent which was a very kind of catch-all term used for anybody who didn't seem to be of native English descent at the time was basically ordered to leave the country within um within three months and if they didn't there was a death penalty I think when we found that it kind of immediately introduced a really interesting new level of state to the story you know it stopped kind of being just a personal story about a young woman in isolation and actually it became a very potent dramatic situation so once you'd made that decision um what was the process in terms of like finding the money because it's not um you know pirates versus zombies it's not necessarily the easiest sell um to uh to, you know to distributors or to funders or people who are interested how did you go through that process no, I really want to make Pirates vs. Zombies. I know it's been done. Me but, too. You know. <laughs> I mean, actually, funnily enough, the the fact that we were being so, I don't know, bold, I wouldn't say brave nearly, but bold in our um, approach to the, the the themes of the film of the film and also the you know the way that we wanted to exhibit them. You know, we were very, very explicit in the fact that we weren't going to shy away from any of the hardships that were being you know, exhibited in the film. I think that actually was an appealing thing for, for the funders that we involved. So to begin with, we started a crowdfunding campaign and that was the sort of the first start. And then as the crowdfunding campaign started um, a little bit of traction, we started getting people coming forward from outside investors saying, you know, we'd actually be very interested in having a conversation about this and how this film's going to work and, and the kind of approach that you're going to take. Um, we, you know, we'd I've had quite a few successful short films in the past, you know, and between us, we'd worked on some, you know, some good projects that had got some good notes. So, you know, people knew that we were capable of making it. And yeah, over over a quite a short space of time, I think, you know, I was on the phone to Laura in February, and I just said, "Let's do it." You know, we're going to do it. I don't know how. I don't know how it's going to work, but you know, let's take the attitude of build it, and they will come. And remarkably, you know, we did we did start that process, and I think that was in February, and we actually were filming in July and or in July in the end of the beginning of August that year. So it was a very fast process, and I think that all of those things serendipitously actually helped spur it on. We kind of didn't give ourselves an out. We didn't give ourselves a, an opportunity not to do it. And the people who came on board, we were able to say, listen. We want to do this really quickly. If you want to be involved, it has to be now. And we have to do it now. And this is how we're going to do it. And I think everyone found that kind of exciting. The main character basically doesn't speak. I believe she says one word, perhaps, in the whole thing, or or tries to say one word. Um, and so casting, you know, it, the film sort of lives or dies on on its casting. So much of it is is about her and her relationship with with the, uh, the brother-in-law. Can you talk a bit about, like, how you went about that? Yeah, it was so much about collaboration right from the start as well, kind of working with people that we had established relationships with, you know, all of the crew were kind of people that Bill had worked with on previous productions that he kind of had that, um, you know, that shorthand with. Um, and the actress who plays Patience, which is the lead character of the film, is an incredible actress called Hannah Douglas, who Phil and I had worked with previously on um, theatre plays. It was funny, I think, before either of us even sort of said it to the other person, we both knew that we had her in mind. Um, so, you know, when I was kind of planning the story and even when I was writing the short film, I was thinking of Hannah. So it was a really lovely moment when we both kind of went, well, it's it's Hannah, isn't it? <laughs> For someone who doesn't say anything, it was so important to be able to communicate via emotion you know to be able to tell the story through the way that she's feeling so we can gauge her journey properly um the david character i said well like you know to be honest it's just about finding someone who can embody someone who's so horrific but at the same time not be a pantomime villain 
there is some level of humanity in him, um, which is also quite a hard thing to portray. Um, so um, I had a Zoom call with Emmett and we started a Zoom call and he just started asking a few questions about the text. And then I think about three and a half hours later, we were both, I was in my garden, he was in his garden. We were both had a beer in our hands and we were talking about films that we loved. And that's, you know, he said, well, you know, what do you think? I was like, mate, you know, if you were, if you were interested in this, I think this is working already. You know, we were talking about the themes and we were exploring so much that it was, it just felt right. So yeah, he was a joy to work with. And Sebastian, you know, is, is phenomenal. He's just, he's just such a talented actor. Um, he has a subtlety that belies his appearance. He's, he's so beautiful. He's such a beautiful man um, that, you know, he could very easily just wander around being beautiful, but he, he just has a really intricate and an assured skill on screen. That's great. So once you've got your cast in place, um, you've deciding to, to shoot on location in the same area where these stories kind of come from. This is not the ideal place to film uh, a film, especially a low budget film. What was that process like? Uh, in hindsight, <laughs> a mistake. No, um, no, it was, it's incredible. You know, it's, it is so visually stunning that you can, you can point the camera pretty much at anything. Um, you know, there's some wind turbines and some, and some, bits of modern around but actually it's a really great place to film historical drama but it's very very remote um we were lucky with the local community they really helped support us you know we were able to set up a kind of little mini village of our own um at the in the local we took over the local village hall and the grounds of the village hall with setting up marquees and you know building our makeup stations there and myself and the dp lived on a caravan on actually on set for the entirety of the shoot which just meant that, you know, at any point we could jump out of the caravan, go for a wander, point the camera at some stuff, say, OK, well, this is nice. You know, before people got to set, we were planning. We were able to look at the chart of the light. You know, where was the sun going? You know, what time of day could we shoot what? But, yeah, it was very challenging from a logistical perspective. Um, we had to walk nearly a mile up the beach to be able to get just to the to the camp where we were filming where my incredible production designer charlotte ball had built our village and every day it was this sort of little pilgrimage that we had to do where everyone went there and they knew that once they were there no matter what the weather was doing no matter how you know how, how things went that's where we were for the day there was probably slightly more accessible places but i did love the idea that this was a place where these people lived and this actually happened there and I think that really, it also got under the actor's skin a bit. They could really understand how remote that life was um, and the psychology and the psychological impact that would have on someone who was living there. The weather was an interesting challenge. We had all the weather known to man except for snow. I think it was the only thing we didn't have. We had, you know, gale force winds, rain, thunderstorms, lightning. There's a scene at the very end where... Um, I don't know if you, you noticed it, but when um, David is shouting something and lightning goes through his head. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's a real moment. And most people we've said that to in Q&As around the country have gone, what? That's, that was CGI. So no, no, that was absolutely real. Um, it was a great moment when I, as he was shouting and the light was his head and I turned to him and went, it's my DP. <laughs> Please tell me that, that we got that. That was the greatest thing ever. Um, so it was, you know, the weather was our friend and it was our enemy. And I guess, Laura, being so isolated from civilization also maybe helped you guys bond as a team. Absolutely. You know, once you then get on set, it's it can that can be quite a jarring experience for everybody involved, I think, at times. But actually, as you say, because there was this kind of almost element of kind of like life imitating art via imitating life that was kind of part of the process of creating and filming Lapwing, it kind of meant that I think there there really were lovely bonds kind of formed between people. And it really did, you know, it really did kind of become like a family. You know, I always think that the best creative relationships are always the ones that either come from friendships or grow into friendships. So you've got it in the can, uh, you've you've made it through the shoot, and then comes post-production. Am I right in saying that the film was much longer uh, once you'd actually put it together than, than the final release? Yeah, just a little bit. Um, a little bit, yeah. So yeah. tell me about, about that process and how you kind of, managed to kind of whittle it down to what it is now well i think um 
I think being our first feature, we were kind of very, uh, very aware of making sure we had enough footage to be able to cut a film that, that you know that told the narrative we wanted to tell and we had lots of we'd written a lot of scenes laura's written a lot of scenes that kind of you know were created so that we had much much almost you know too much um too many options for it, for the directions that the characters could go in um that was a you know a conscious decision that we knew that we were going to lose some of that as we went along in the edit um and whichever moments worked best in the shoot were the ones that we were going to go along with. So the original cut was, I think, two hours 40. Um, and we knew that we wanted, you know, an hour 40 at the at the very most. So we then, you know, Laura and I both sat down and went, okay, well, what, you know, what what's what's the story that's truest to the script? And what are the, you know, the main themes in the script that we were trying to express? Where are the, you know, where are the weak points? Where are the weak moments? The, the things that we don't think were um, translated properly onto the screen. And that was a, you know, it's a hell of a kind of position to be in, really. We were very privileged to have that sort of extra layer. Obviously, you know, as an editor, you know, mm -hmm. the story is... Uh, the story is sculpted in the edit. The rest of the process is just busy work, really. The uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. The real work, <laughs> the real work happens in uh, in the edit. But it is, you know, it's one of those things where I, you know I'm I'm very very aware of the power of the edit and and the fact that the the tone and um uh, and kind of the experience of the viewer is something that can be molded within frames. You know, you change people's opinions and you change people's um, experience of watching something just by the you know the look you use in one frame or the or the tone you use in the piece of soundtrack or whatever it may be and we were lucky to be able to play with that probably more than you know we ever thought we would be able to we came out of filming with no budget you know we we'd used our budget to make the film and i always knew that was going to be the case i knew that we'd have to go and try and find more money after we'd shot the film but for us the biggest hurdle was right let's get this thing in the can and then somehow we'll find out how to do the next bit. Um, and so uh, a blind faith, once again, you know, we started talking to distributors and we started talking to other people that, you know, film furnishing funds and those sorts of places. Um, a lot of which were quite some very interested, but wanted a little bit too much control over what we were doing from that point onwards. And I still felt we'd gone on such a personal journey at that point that it would be a shame to then relinquish it and kind of, you know, lose any kind of editorial control myself as a director or, you know, or have the faith and investment of the people that have got us to that, that point that far kind of diminished by having big guns come in and go, well, thank you very much, but, you know, we're going to sell this film now and we're going to take this massive slice of it and you guys aren't going to see any of that. So then after, you know, after a bit of backwards and forwards, we actually did manage to find some investors and we managed to get the film finished. And then just as we were about to release COVID hit, we would have, you know, we would have been in cinemas a lot sooner. And I think, you know, actually it's worked in our favour because it's given us time for the world to really actually appreciate the film of this kind a little bit more. There's something about the isolation of this film that held that holds quite a poignant um aspect to our daily lives that we went through for quite a long time um but yeah it was a it's made the process a lot slower so you've got distribution the film's out there i believe you've been kind of going around the country doing q and a's with uh, different audiences uh like a, almost like a caravan of of people i suppose have you um what kind of reactions have you been getting uh laura what do you what have you been able to take from uh, from audiences across the country yeah it's been such an interesting experience i think especially after so long of it being kind of a just hours and kind of feeling that sort of keeping it close to you kind of mentality meant that it was quite it was actually quite overwhelming I think when we first kind of realized every like everyone we know is now going to see this and it's you know it's a very um that was quite an exposing experience and just I think you know as filmmakers there's always that question of will people get it will they the you know will they whether they like it or dislike it you know that's kind of that's almost beside the point in some ways like obviously it's not because <laughs> that's the industry that we work in but to an extent there's the bigger or more important question is will they get why we made those creative choices and I think it's just been it's been amazing and so 
lovely to feel that audiences have really understood why we wanted to tell that story and have the, the the themes despite the fact that you know this is a historical drama the themes have resonated so clearly with people today in terms of their own experience of the world and you know some of the conversations and debates that we've had in the q and a's after screenings have been absolutely kind of fascinating i mean i think yeah there's been the whole kind of full gamut of responses um and questions that have kind of been put to us which has been amazing to you know be on the receiving end of something that's that's getting people um you know feeling passionate and wanting to ask questions and wanting to know more and and pushing themselves to maybe kind of understand or grapple with something difficult a little bit more has has been amazing we've kind of had everything from you know standing ovations in crowds that we don't know to in 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 a one particular venue people were actually fighting not physically, but having arguments with each other in the auditorium whilst we sat on the stage going, wow, about the themes, you know, about the film. They were standing up and saying, no, you're wrong. It's, it should be about blah, 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 blah. You know, and, and this is how it made me feel. And to, you know, to have that kind of impact is surely what, you know, what's the, that's what filmmaking is about. That's great. That's great. So finally, what's next for you guys? What does the future hold? It's been really interesting to kind of think about what our next film is. Um, and it's really exciting at the moment. We're kind of in the early stages of development on the kind of, you know, not not the follow up to that point in any way, but the same not team. Not the same a sequel. <laughs> no, <laughs> very much not. A sequel. Although there have Lapping. been quite a yeah, quite a few people have uh, have asked what happens next and have been, I think there's quite a few people who would be quite keen for some kind of Lapwing sequel, which I just find really quite amusing <laughs> that that's a thing. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, the completely different project that we're working on, it's actually a folk horror. And so going into something that is, you know, bigger budget is kind of comes with um, all of those elements of kind of taking the next step up in our careers, looking to work with new people as well as kind of existing collaborators. What I did really learn through kind of dipping a toe really with Lapwing and, and then embracing the kind of psychological thriller element um, was that genre gives you some really exciting kind of tools to work with in terms of that storytelling. So I'm, I'm super excited about kind of um, embracing the fact that I've always loved things like The Wicker Man um, and bringing a little bit of kind of contemporary modern English folk tale to the screen in that kind of horror genre is is super exciting well as i said i thought the film was wonderful and i'm really really pleased and proud of you for getting through it and making it and um thanks so much for for talking to me about it today thank you so much for having us it's been a pleasure yeah. thank you ever so much it's been wonderful